One of the things that's most interesting to me as an aviation geek, as an aviation nerd, is if you were to say to an average individual or maybe a commercial pilot, a lot of commercial pilots listen to this, and they were to see something, what is your first step? What do people do? And, and it could be I'm even on the ground witnessing some sort of phenomenon, but in particular in the air, just take it from that perspective. I'm flying along the coast of California. I see something. What do mm -hmm. I do? Well, you do what you should always do as a pilot, which is aviate, navigate, and communicate. You shouldn't necessarily let yourself be distracted by what you're seeing. At this point in the game, right, you don't know what this object is. The idea here is that if you see something that's unidentified, that you should now, you know, go deviate from your course to go inspect or something like that, right? So that's not what's being uh, communicated here. You should be a professional pilot if you do observe it and you believe it could be a threat uh, to other air traffic. The proper procedure would be to reach out to your air traffic controller and see if um, that traffic is known. And if not, you'd like to give them a position where it is so they can uh, warn other traffic about it. Uh, one thing I've been hearing from talking with commercial pilots is that so essentially what's been happening right now is that they'll see something either at their altitude or in the vicinity of their altitude. Other aircraft are seeing it as well, and they're calling up the ATC, and they're all kind of confirming it that it's there, and that they don't know what it is, and they can visually see it, but there's nothing else really to do at that point. Right. So that's part of the problem I've been trying to um, resolve is that there is no real mechanism to report this, uh, both from a, a military perspective as well as a commercial perspective. On the military perspective, at this point to see, we didn't really have the ability to report unknown objects in any way that would have got resolved. It was simply we had the Navy aviation safety reporting mechanisms, uh, and those are, you know, not an investigatory type uh, of system. It's ASAP more, reports. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, it's data collection after the fact. So there really was nothing. And if those represented, you know, potentially adversarial platforms, that was ultimately my fear at the time was that these could have potentially been some type of platform just spying on us. And that's something I've been communicating uh, a bit on. Uh, I'm getting off track here, so I'll jump back. On the commercial side, what, what should the pilots do? Right now in the FAR, in the, FAR the uh, Federal Aviation Regulations, I believe it is, it instructs uh, air crew, if they would like to report uh, one of these, they don't require it in any way. Uh, they essentially suggest that the, the air crew or the witness could go report that to any number of quote, quote, UFO reporting centers that are out in the general public, none of which are well-funded or, you know, consistent with each other. And so more or less information just gets scattered out. And so that's one of the issues that I'm working to resolve from a procedural point with the AIAA to be able to make those recommendations, but also with the other organization I started, Americans for Safe Aerospace, where we can provide general education and, and education on Capitol Hill to be able to push for those procedures, be able to push for that, you know, potentially mandatory reporting so that pilots don't feel like they can't, can't bring that information forward to ATC right. and also, yeah. Is it, I mean, there's a stigma in aviation, you know, you do something, there's a pilot deviation, the air traffic controllers, here's a phone number to call, you know, which you're supposed to write down right after you had some incident. You know, is there a sense that like pilots are not reporting because they're going to get on some list with, you know, Will, Will Smith's going to come up and do some clicking to them or, or that the FAA is going to pull their ticket. They can't fly anymore on the commercial side. Is yeah, there concerns I, about that? I don't think it's uh, anything, uh, you know, men in black nefarious, but guys just generally don't want to be associated with it. They don't want to answer for it. Uh, they'd rather keep their head down. And, you know, I say that from the context of the people that have been calling me for the past, you know, eight months or more, yeah. that's what they're reporting. And when they first reached out to me, you know, some of the stories were guys didn't even want to call it out to ATC right. because they didn't want their call sign associated with that report, essentially. So that's where the state of affairs was. Of course, it's not evenly spread, but I hear that's better now. People are calling it out more, but it was disappointing to see that during the NASA uh, independent study team public meeting, that the FAA representative communicated that he wasn't even aware of any procedures for pilots to report on. Yes, yeah, that's uh, like one of the worst things, right? Yeah, they seem to be good at, you know, kind of punishing pilots. And, and if the FAA is out there, please do not, you know, pull my ticket. Ariel, we, we talked over lunch not too long ago about, you know, events, things you saw when you were in combat or in training, you're flying a Super Hornet also. By the, were you both single seat pilots? Was it both single seat aircraft or were, did you guys double? I was single seat. Uh, Ryan flew two seaters. You told me once, and maybe you could tell the story, but your encounter with a UAP at the time. Uh, I can't, can you actually? actually? No, no. I, I, in both cases, it was observable for me. So I, I didn't have any anything uh, too crazy. I One time in the whiskey areas off the coast of Virginia, we did pick up a lot of little like scatter and uh one i was able to to lock onto this and it ended up i did a right to right with a balloon there was another time in the persian gulf and this was more worrisome because i'm coming off the carrier i, I pick up a, a contact going real slow uh not getting called out from from uh air traffic on at the boat lock him up uh i have a 9x missile which 
all has another sensor on it and that actually gets tone which tells me there's something there uh end up doing a right to right with a iranian drone yeah, that was right to right means you're, you're squaring off so sort of basically like, we just kind of flew right by it yeah. yeah so it was an iranian drone that was orbiting near the near the carrier you know dangerous from a standpoint of one we should be aware of that it's there which the boat may have been it was just more warning the pilots hey you know and I, you know i remember reading in donald rumsfeld's biography you know, of, of all places that you know he said once that if uh president bush wanted to kill somebody it took about 17 different phone calls and you know telegrams and encrypted you know data sources before that person would meet his uh, uh untimely you know, his or her we should be inclusive <laughs> a lot of, a lot of uh you know worrisome women out there right um what what about that? If you saw this, you identify it as as some threat from a from a hostile nation. Do you have authorization? You have tone. You know, I mean, you said that that means. By the way, we should we should. Although you and I are aviation nerds, and Ryan is as well. What is lock on? What kind of sensor technology are we talking about? These are radar sensors or a flare. What what are they exactly? The what, radar usually is the first sensor you're going to use. Uh, that's kind of your broadest that's going to pick up the most. Everything else starts to, to zero in. So in that case, I was coming off the boat and, and we have to do checks on our, our system. So that's why I, I use the 9X. And that's a sidewinder, that's a sidewinder mm -hmm. missile. It's a heat, heat it, it looks for heat sources. Mm -hmm. You know, even at that point, my, my aircraft's safe. There's no way for me to shoot this missile. Like, man, I have no intention to do that. To broader on your question, we would have to have, I mean, there are rules of engagement that are very clear that dictate how you can employ your weapon systems. And with it being a peacetime scenario, unless that drone fired upon me or was looking to be a threat to U.S. forces, there's nothing I would really legally be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're hamstrung pretty tightly with the ROE, but it also allows you to keep, keep yourself safe. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're not in, in, in hostilities at that point. Uh, Fortunately, we're not in hostilities. So. Right. Well, yeah. 